Amen. Thank you, choir. A lot of great truth in that song. I do have a little announcement to make before I begin preaching today, uh, and it is very serious. It concerns our youth group. That got your attention, didn't it? It's a lock-in uh, this Thursday night from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. here at the church. So if any of you youth would like to come, any adults are welcome to do that. 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. Did you get that? Okay. Some of you, that's your bedtime, 8 p.m., and you get up at 6. So uh, they're going to have a lock-in where it's fall break this week. Uh, so all of our youth are going to be doing that. Uh, so you pray for Diane and for that group as they have their lock-in this Thursday night. And I know they'll have a great time with that. And wouldn't it be nice to be young again and just have all that energy? Amen? Amen? All right. Some of you are thinking, you know, I'm pretty young anyway, so. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter number 11, and we're going to look this morning at what's known as the Northern Campaign as we're getting close here uh, to the end of the first division of the book of Joshua as we uh, are looking at the battles and we're looking at uh, Israel conquering the land and possessing the land, and uh, then we look at a few chapters over the next few weeks of uh, dividing up the land, and we look towards the end of the book of Joshua. Some of the chapters we may uh, hit and miss there because it talks a lot about the rosters of kings. We've got a lot of hard names in there, and we'll, we'll look at a few verses there. But chapter 11, day in just a moment, we'll read verses 1 through 15. But what I've titled the message today, it's staying the course, and it's finishing the race. As Paul said, you know, I have finished my course, and Paul mentions about running the race. The book of Hebrews tells us about running the race with patience. And it's staying on course, it's finishing the task, it's completing the mission, it's running the race. And really when you look at it, staying the course is doing exactly what God wants you to do. And it's obedience. And that's what we have to do. Because Joshua and the Israelites, they've been fighting uh, for nearly seven years. And you say, well, where do you get the seven years? Well, I think you have to look at different passages. Uh, in the book of Joshua, uh, Caleb was around 78 years old when they entered the land to conquer it. And when they begin to uh, divide up the inheritance... Caleb's around 85, so somewhere around six or seven years, Joshua and the Israelites have been fighting these battles. So, it's, you know, we can sit down and read this in one setting. We think, well, this just took place over a few months. But it was, it was a continuous war, some six, seven years that they were fighting. And so they, no doubt they were getting tired and weary and worn down, and they were becoming exhausted and fatigued. And, but they needed to press onward, and they needed to continue doing what God had called them to do. And the important task was completing the mission. It was staying the course and doing what God had told them to do. In verse 15, as we'll read in just a moment, the Bible says Joshua left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. He left nothing undone. Now, if I were to ask you today, have you ever started something and you didn't get around to completing that or finishing that? Now, I'll tell you a little story about myself. I don't talk about myself a whole lot up here, but I'm proud of this. Back years ago, uh, my wife and I took karate, and so I'm telling you that so you'll fear me, okay? Uh, so you won't mess with me anymore. But the thing about it, I began taking karate, and boy, I could stretch good, and I was in good shape. Of course, I was about <clears throat> 20 years old, 19, 20, 21, somewhere in that neighborhood, and, and I got right up to one belt away from getting a black belt. And, you know, I thought, boy, I'm going to get this, and I, and I didn't go anymore. I was working, going to school, had a wife, had a child, and had different things going on. And I never went back, and I kept thinking every year, I'm going to go back and finish this course, and I'm going to earn this black belt. And so that way, when anyone messes with me, they're going to be in trouble. And so, uh, but you know what? A couple years went by and didn't go back. A couple years went by and didn't go back. Guess what? It's been 30-something years, and I've never completed that. Did you know that? Now, that's not telling you not to mess with me because I'm still tough, okay? But the thing about it, we put things off. We have good intentions. We say, you know what? I need to do this. This needs to be done. I should do this. But we put those things off. You know what that's called? Procrastination. You ever heard that little word? Why do something today when I can put it off till tomorrow? And it's many times we do those things like that. And, you know, we look at Joshua and that. Joshua could have had good intentions. He said, well, we've conquered the central region, the southern region. We're not going to go to the northern part. We'll we'll just be satisfied. We kind of saw this last week. We'll just be satisfied with what we have, and we won't keep going, and we won't fight anymore. Well, if he did that, then he wouldn't be completing the mission. He wouldn't be staying the course. 
And you know, many times we do that. We're bad about putting things off. Now, if I were to ask you today to raise your hand, how many of you are bad about putting things off? Don't raise your hand, but how many of you would raise your hand? That's a trick question, okay? I'm just making sure you're listening to me today. But you know what? We have good intentions sometimes. Oh, I need to mow the grass today. But then we say, well, you know what? It's too hot, or it's too cold, or it's too wet. Or you know what? It really hadn't grown that much. Or you know the worst thing we think, well, I need to pressure wash that sun deck, and I need to stain that sun deck. But then we get up and we think, well, you know what? I'll do it in the spring. It comes around the spring. We think, well, I'll do it in the fall. Or maybe it's that exercise program we need to start. Maybe it's that diet we need to start. Maybe it's that painting around the house. Maybe it's buying that new car. Well, we know we need to do this, but we have good intentions. And the thing about it, when we get down to the excuses, basically, we really don't want to do it, do we? We don't want to put the time in and the energy and the effort or spend the money or whatever it may be. We know it needs to be done, but yet we don't want to do that. And, you know, sadly, we begin something many times, and we don't finish that. And we don't complete the course. We don't finish the race. And we don't stay the course. We don't remain on course. There's things that get us distracted, things that get our minds off of that. And we say, well, I'm going to do something easier. I'm going to do something safer. I'm going to do something that doesn't cost as much money or doesn't cost as much of my time, whatever it may be. And the bad thing about it, listen, folks, sometimes we do that in church, don't we? We say, you know what? I need to start reading my Bible every day. And we get enthused, excited, motivated. We do it there for about a week or two then for whatever reason. We kind of lose that excitement, that enthusiasm, that motivation. And we're not remaining faithful and obedient. Or it may be, you know what, I need to start coming to Sunday school next Sunday. And we get up that Sunday morning, it's kind of foggy, it's kind of wet, it's kind of dark. And we think, well, I'll do it next Sunday. I need to start coming on Wednesday night. Well, I won't come this Wednesday night. I'll come next Wednesday night. And we, we procrastinate. We put those things off. We know they need to be done, but we have good intentions. But a lot of times that's all they are. They're good intentions. Now, what we see today in the 11th chapter of Joshua is what's known many times as the final conquest, the final campaign, before the land is divided up between the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Joshua and Israel had been fighting battle after battle for nearly seven years. They were tired. They were weary. They were run down. They, they were exhausted. They were fatigued. But they had to keep going because they could have stopped right there and said, you know what, we've done enough. And we, we, we think we've done enough here, so we're just going to take back and we're just going to rest and relax and, and we're not going to finish the task God has given us to do. Well, that wasn't Joshua's attitude. Joshua said, you know what, I need to remain on course. I need to stay the course. I need to complete the task and finish the race and complete the mission because sadly many times we as Christians, we've entered that race, but we've never crossed the finish line. Or maybe we've entered the race and for many of us, we can't even see the finish line. Because we start something, we lose that enthusiasm, that excitement, that motivation. We're no longer faithful, we're no longer obedient, and we just kind of quit. We kind of drop off, and we kind of put those things off. Oh, we, we know I need to do that, and this needs to be done, but we're not willing to put the time and the effort and the sacrifice or whatever it is in. Well, we need to finish, folks, what God has called us to do. Now, the particular race that Joshua and the Israelites were in, the race was conquering and possessing the land. God had given them the land. God had promised victory. But he said, Joshua, look, you need to remain faithful. You need to remain obedient. And you need to complete the task. Because when you complete the task, there are unlimited blessings awaiting you. And so you need to finish that. So what does it mean to stay the course? What does it mean to remain on course? What does it mean to finish the course? What does it mean to start something and complete that? Remaining faithful and obedient to what God has called us to do. Because listen, folks, just as God promised Joshua, God has promised us victory, amen? And God has promised us a land in heaven. And all that's required of us is that we must remain faithful and obedient to what God has called us to do and finish the work on earth that he has given us to do. And guess what awaits us? Unlimited blessings. Amen? Joshua chapter 11. Look at them in verse number 1. And we'll read down through verse 15. It came to pass when Jabin, King of Hazor had heard those things that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Akshal, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains, and to the plain south of Kinneroth, and in the valley and in the borders of Dor on the west, and to the Canaanite on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Jebusite in the mountains, and to the Hivite under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. And they went out, they and all their hosts with them, much people, 
even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots, very many. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up, all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hawk their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Merom. Suddenly they fell upon them, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them unto great Zanon, and into Misrephoth, Maom, and into the valley of Mizpah eastward. And they smote them until they had left, left none of them remaining. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hawked their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. Verse 10. And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with a sword. For Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe, and he burned Hazor with fire. And all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them did Joshua take, smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them, save Hazor only, that did Joshua burn. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves, but every man they smote with the edge of the sword. Until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. Look at verse 15. It says, As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. And so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Let's read that again. It said, Joshua left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Then we're going to see later that they didn't actually possess all of the land. There were still smaller city-states that the individual tribes would conquer. But these are talking about the major battles, the major wars, the major uh, cities and, and uh, situations there that they had to take care of. And so Joshua was finishing the course. He was finishing the race. He was staying on course. And what it took, he had to remain faithful. He had to remain obedient. He had to have a great confidence in God and a great trust in God. And he had to believe God in his word. We know that. We've seen that already throughout the book of Joshua. And that's what it takes for us. Would We need to stay the course and remain on course and finish the course and complete what God has called us to do. Folks, it takes a lot of great confidence in God and trust in God and faith in God and believing God and believing his word. Because let me tell you something. If we doubt God... And if we have no faith in God or little faith in God and little trust in God, and we don't really believe God and his word, guess what? We're defeated right then and there. Did you know that? Because we're limiting God and we're saying, God, I don't know if you can do this. I don't know if you can do the impossible. I don't know if you can heal this body. I don't know if you can take care of this marriage. I don't know if you can save this person. I don't know if you can bless our church. And I don't know if you can do these things. I don't know if you can do it. And so we're putting doubt in our minds that we really don't trust God. We really don't believe God. We really don't have a great confidence in God and, and, and a great belief in God because we're starting to limit God. Well, Joshua could have done that. He could have said, you know what? We've done enough. And we, we, we're right there at the finish line, and we're going to stop. And we're, going to, we're not going to complete this race or finish this course or remain on course. But Joshua said, no, God's told us to cross the finish line. He's told us, he said, here's the land I want you to take, and this is the land that I have to take. Whatever it takes, I'm going to do that. I'm going to remain faithful and obedient to what God has called us to do. Now, if you look at our passage here today, we see here where this is what's known as the northern campaign. These are cities which are up around the Sea of Galilee. He's gone into the central area, kind of the middle part of Israel, and then he's gone to the southern part. We saw that in the last chapter. And now he's completing that, and he's going up to the north, up around the Sea of Galilee, uh, Lebanon, all those places up in there, taking this land that God had given to him. And so when he begins to do that, there was a man by the name of Jabin. He was the king of Hazor. And Hazor was a city just north of the Sea of Galilee. And the Bible tells us here, when Jabin heard those things, he heard how Joshua and the Israelites were winning battles in the south. And they'd won some battles in the central region. And he'd heard of the might and the power of Joshua and his army. And he heard these things, much like Rahab had heard, much like all these other kings had heard. And God was placing the fear and the dread of Israel in the hearts of these people. And so... This king heard of these things. He said, you know what? I need to stop Joshua and I need to stop Israel because they're going to come at us and they're going to destroy our cities and take our people and take our land. Well, that's exactly what God wanted them to do. 
Remember, Israel was being used as an instrument of judgment against these people because of their wickedness, because of their idolatry, because of their immorality. They had refused to repent and turn to God. And so God was using Israel as his instrument of judgment. So Jabin here, he sends to Jabath. Now, you can look at that thing, and, you know, when you read that name there, it looks like Jobob, okay? And I thought, that's fitting for Madison County. Is that right? Now, I can talk about that because I grew up here, and I was born here. So no one come to me and say, well, you're from somewhere else, and you're making fun of us. I'm not making fun of you, okay? And if your name today is Jobob, hallelujah, amen? Okay. Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Sherman, the king of Akshah. Those were towns in the north. And all the kings there in verse number 2, it says of the plain south of Kinneroth. Now that was a, an earlier name for the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Kinneroth. And there was also a little town there on the northern edge of Sea of Galilee. And in the valley and the borders are the heights of Dor on the west. So it's all the northern part. And he sent to the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, Perizzite, Jebusite, the Hivite, uh, under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. So all in that northern area there. And even Jebusites were in Jerusalem. It was not an Israelite town at this time or city. And so he, he goes to get this coalition. And we saw this in the last chapter. We see where this king, they're afraid of Israel. And they, they call out for their allies and form a coalition to come against Israel. And but verse 4 says, They went out, they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots, very many. Now, let's stop there for just a minute. If you're Joshua right here, You've been fighting battle after battle for several years. And you know your army's tired and they're worn down and they're fatigued and they're exhausted. And you think, boy, we need some morale here. And we need some refreshment and rest and revival and renew and to be recharged. By the way, that's why we have revival sometimes. Amen? And Gary hit it on the head singing, revive us again. Because we get a little worn down and tired in the battles of life. And in the wars of life, and we struggle and we fight and we struggle and we fight. And sometimes we need to say, hey, I just need a little rest. I need some refreshment. I need to recharge my battery for the Lord. That's why many times we don't stay the course because we wear down and we're tired. And so this army was like that. And all these multitude came to fight against Joshua and against Israel. And he's thinking, what am I going to do here? Am I going to trust God? Am I going to believe God? Am I going to do what God tells me to do? But if you notice there in verse 4, it says there were much people. The Jewish historian Josephus, now it's not in the Bible here, so I don't know if it's true or not, but he said there, he, he writes, recorded maybe 300,000 troops, 10,000 horses and chariots. The, a lot of these nations used horses and chariots in battle. Israel didn't use those because they were not to multiply horses. They were to depend slowly upon the Lord for their strength, not on any horses and chariots. That's why they were to disable them. And so all these come up, very many. Much like at the end time of the Battle of Armageddon, where there will be many nations coming together under the forces of Antichrist and his evil forces to come and to come against the nation of Israel as they gather together to fight. But let me tell you something, folks, and I hope you get this today. Joshua was greatly outnumbered. Do you believe that? Joshua was greatly outnumbered. But let me tell you something. Although Israel was greatly outnumbered, God is never outnumbered. Amen? One with God is a majority. God is never outnumbered. And so Israel, you know, Joshua could have said, well, I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to look at my circumstances, and I'm going to look at my situation, and boy, I'm going to get down. And that's what we do many times. There's often times that I mention we're not to keep our eyes on our circumstances, our situation, but we keep our eyes on God. Because when we see God and our eyes are on God, we don't see the circumstances and the situations. And there's a lot of things that we faced here in the last few months that we're, we could get our eyes on the circumstances and the situation and say, you know what, I'm wore down and I'm tired and I'm fatigued and I'm weary and I'm not going to continue on. I'm not going to finish the race. I'm not going to stay on course. I'm just ready to quit and I'm ready to give up and I'm ready to throw in the towel and it's not worth it anymore. That's what the devil wants you to do. Amen? That's what he wants you to do. But we have to keep our eyes on God. That's what Joshua was doing, keeping his eyes on God. Not on the circumstances, not the fact that he's outnumbered. Because he knew that with God, hey, one's a majority. God's never outnumbered. And so we see there in verse 5, when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom, which was up around the Sea of Galilee, to fight against Israel. But you know what? Those who honor God can be victorious regardless of the odds. Did you know that? 
Sometimes odds are against us. You ever feel that way in society today? Say amen. You ever feel like the world's against you? You ever feel like that everything you do, that what you hear on television is opposite of what you believe? Opposite of what you value? And it's, it's totally opposite of what you have in your heart? It gets overwhelming sometimes, doesn't it? But if we keep our eyes on God, we don't worry about those things. And that's what Joshua had to do. Now look in verse number 6. Once again, there's God. Right time, right place, right person for the right reason. Joshua didn't have his eyes on God. The Lord said unto Joshua, be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hawk their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now, if you're Joshua right there, would you believe God? We say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd believe God. Would you really believe God? Would you really, really believe God when he tells you, hey, you have a sickness, but I can heal that disease. Do you really believe God? Do you really believe God when you're at the casket of a loved one and you know that loved one's in heaven and people are telling you, hey, you know, God will comfort you and encourage you and assure you. Do you really believe God? Do you really believe God when your marriage is falling apart and you're praying to God? Do you really believe God can restore that? Do you really believe that? Say amen. Do you really believe that? See, Joshua had a decision to make there. And you know what? There's a lot of things we cannot control in life. But let me tell you something we can control. And that's the choice to obey God. Did you know that? There's a lot of things that's out of our control. We can't control. But we can control our choice to obey God. And so look what Joshua does here. It says, the Lord said to him, once again, God encourages and reassures and comforts him. Once again, he promises Joshua victory. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 5 of the book of Joshua. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 5. Remember when God initially spoke to Joshua and he said, Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. You're going to be the man to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Look in chapter 1 and verse 5. God says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Now let's stop there for a minute. Had God been with Joshua up to this point? He had, hadn't he? He says, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Let me ask you folks, had he failed Joshua yet? Had he forsaken Joshua yet? He abandoned Joshua, deserted Joshua? Said, Joshua, I can't use you anymore. I'm going to put you over the side. You're not my man anymore. He hadn't done that. God had remained faithful. You see, folks, God had stayed the course. God's finishing the race. God wasn't quitting. And God's telling Joshua, Joshua, don't you quit on me because I'm not going to quit on you. You remain faithful and you remain obedient. I brought you through this whole ordeal. I brought you to this point, and I'm going to finish what I've called you to do. I'm going to be with you. You just trust me. I'll take care of the enemy for you. And he says there in verse number 6, The Lord said to Joshua, Be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow, God gives a specific time. Tomorrow about this time, God says, I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to deliver them all, all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hawk their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now, what does that mean? It means they're going to hamstring. They cut the tendon in the back of the horse's leg, would disable them and, and uh, cripple the horse to where they were rendered useless in battle. And the reason we see that, I think, is because God says, look, I don't want you to depend on horses and chariots for battle. I want you to depend on me. I don't want your eyes on a horse or a chariot. I want your eyes on me because I'm going to give you the victory. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to be with you. Don't quit on me because I'm not going to quit on you. So Joshua had a choice to make in verse 7. Let's see what Joshua did. So Joshua came and all the people of Or with him and against them by the waters of Merim suddenly and they fell upon him. Let me ask you folks, did Joshua believe God? How many of you think he believed God? Say amen. amen. I said say amen, not raise your hand. You raised your hand because I raised my hand. Isn't that right? Now if I jump off this platform, are you going to jump off this platform? Are you? No, thank you. Okay. But you know what? Did Joshua believe God? He did, didn't he? Joshua believed God, didn't he? He said, he said I'm going to go, and I'm going to fight these people. I might be outnumbered, but you know what? It doesn't matter if I'm outnumbered because God's never outnumbered. My eyes are on God. They're not on my circumstances. They're not on my situation. I'm walking by faith, not by sight. So Joshua came and all the people with him, and they fell upon them. Verse 8, look at verse 8. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. Go back to verse 6. 
The Lord said to Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them of all slain before Israel. Verse 8, The Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. Did God keep his promise? You better believe he did. When God promised you eternal life, does God keep his promise? He's going to keep his promise. God promised to forgive you of your sins. He's going to keep that promise? You better believe he is. Does God promise, look, when you go through a death of a loved one or a sickness or this or that or the other, God says, I won't leave you or forsake you. Does God keep his promise? You better believe he does. See, God's always faithful. We can't really comprehend that in our human mind sometimes. We can't uh, digest that or calculate that in our mind. But God's always faithful, folks. God doesn't leave us. God says, I'm not going to quit on you. Don't you quit on me. I'm going to be right there with you, and I'm going to be right there for you. So the Lord delivered them in the hand of Israel. Exactly what God told him he was going to do. Who smote them in verse 8. Chased them into great Zidon and these other places. This was in the north. And they smote them until they left them none remaining. This was the band. They were to destroy everything right here. Now look at verse number 9. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. Do you see obedience? Do you see that there? Do you see obedience? All throughout the book of Joshua, one of the main themes is obedience. Complete obedience equals complete victory. Did you hear that? Complete obedience equals complete victory. Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. God said, I want you to destroy them. Joshua said, okay, I'll do exactly what you tell me to do. He hawked their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. He did exactly what God said he could do. Now, Joshua could say, you know what? These horses look awful nice. And these chariots, boy, we could use these chariots in battle. My army's tired. My army's worn out. And, man, they could get in this chariot and ride, and these horses would be fancy. We'd look good on these horses. You know, these are the Cadillacs and so forth. These are the Corvettes. And, boy, we'd look nice on them. But God said, Joshua, I don't want you to do that. I want you to cripple them. I want you to destroy them so that you won't depend on them. Joshua did exactly what God told him to do. And you know what? I believe Joshua believed that God was able. Do you believe that? God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Joshua believed God could do the impossible. He had a great confidence in God, and a great faith in God, and a great trust in God, and a great belief in God. And see, that's the problem with so many Christians today. We doubt God. We don't have confidence in God. We don't have that trust in God like we should. We don't have that faith in God like we should. We limit God. We bring down God to our level. And we say, well, God can't take care of me, and God can't heal this, and God can't do that. Well, let me tell you something, folks. The God I read about in the Bible, God can. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, look at verses 10 and 11. Joshua at that time turned back and he took Hazor. This was the, really the major city in the north. It was the capital, so to speak. Smote the king, Jabin, there with the sword. For Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. You see, by destroying that, he was kind of breaking the backbone of the federation. And he was weakening the will of the people to resist. It'd be like, you know, today coming and capturing Washington, D.C. Well, that kind of breaks our backbone. It kind of, you know, we, we can't resist anymore because the seat of government has been taken over. And so that's what happens here. And he goes in and he, and he takes Hazor and they smote all the souls that were there at the edge of the sword. Utterly destroying them, there was not any left to breathe, and he burnt Hazor with fire. Verse 12, and all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take, smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them. Look in the last part of verse 12. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. You see, many times, folks, obedience, complete obedience equals complete victory. Complete obedience equals complete victory. Joshua was obeying. Moses had given him commands. Earlier in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, God told Joshua, I want you to keep all the book of the law that Moses gave you. I want you to have it in your heart day and night. Meditate upon it. Read it. Study it. Apply it. That's what he says here. Joshua says, I'm going to obey what Moses commanded me because God had commanded Moses that. So basically, I'm obeying God. And so I'm going to listen to what the words say, and I'm going to obey these, and I'm going to do those, and I'm going to apply these to my life. Look at verse 13. He says, but as for the cities that stood still in their strength. These were mound cities. Many times cities in the ancient Near East, and they would be destroyed, and they would be piled up as rubble or debris, and they would build cities on top of that. And many times they would keep some of the captured cities intact. They wouldn't destroy them because they would move in and live in those. And they would be centers of commerce and centers of defense. And so this is what it's talking about. These cities stood in the street. Israel burned none of them save Hazor only. That did Joshua burn. So you remember God told, or Moses was mentioned in Deuteronomy 6, said you're going to go in places and you're going to live in cities that you didn't build. And you're going you're to eat crops you didn't plant. 
and you're going to do this, God is giving this them, he's giving this to them. This is a gift of God to them. These are the cities you live in them. You didn't build them, but you live in them. And you know what? That reminds me of heaven. I didn't build heaven. I didn't prepare heaven. But you know what? God says one day you're going to live there, amen? He said, I prepared a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And God gives us today. He said, you didn't grow that food, but I'm going to give it to you. You didn't do this, but I'm going to give it to you. Those are unlimited blessings right here. And so this is what they were doing. Look at verse 14. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. There was the reward for victory. There was the reward right there. This is what they were to take. These were spoils of war. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. And once again, we say, well, that seems pretty harsh and pretty barbaric, but this is what God had told them to do, instrument of judgment. Now look lastly at verse 15. Verse number 15 says, As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. You know what that tells me? Moses was faithful to God's word, wasn't he? He's, God gave Moses word. Moses said, Joshua, you're going to be the leader, successor. I'm going to give you what God told me. And the Bible says there in verse 15, Joshua did these things. He obeyed what Moses told him because it came from God. But look at the last part of verse number 15. It says, Joshua left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Can you go to bed tonight and say, I've left nothing undone of all the Lord gave me to do? Could you do that tonight? I'll tell you right now, I couldn't do that, could you? Could you go to, go to sleep tonight and say, you know what? I've done everything today that God asked me to do. And sometimes we beat ourselves over the head with that, don't we? We can't sleep, we stay awake, we can't do this, we can't do that. We think, well, there's so much to do and so little time to do it. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of things, folks, we can't control. But we can control our choice to obey God. Do you believe that? You know, I can obey God or I don't have to obey God. It doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't matter the circumstances. It doesn't matter what I can't control. I'm going to choose to obey God. Because remember what Joshua says later in his book? As for me and my house, we're going to do what? We're going to serve the Lord. That's his choice. That's his choice to obey God. He chose to obey God. He could have said, well, I'm not going to obey anymore. I've come this far. I've done this much. I have these achievements. These are con It's time to retire. It's time to resign. It's time to take a rest. It's time to take a rest. God said, that's not what I want you to do, Joshua. I want you to finish the course. I want you to finish the race. I want you to remain on course. I want you to cross that finish line. I want you to do exactly what I've called you to do. So Joshua left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, and I'm going to end with this verse today. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, listen to what Paul writes. And this is a verse that should be very familiar to you. Paul writes and says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will do what? Will perform it, complete it, fulfill it, accomplish it, finish it, carry it through until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something today, folks. I hope you take this with you. God will never, ever quit on you. Did you know that? No matter what you've done, no matter what you've not done, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you're facing ahead, no matter what you're going through right now, let me tell you, God will never, ever quit on you. Isn't that great confidence? Isn't that great assurance? That's what Joshua believed. You see, that's what Joshua thought. And that's what Joshua took in his heart. He knew, hey, God's not going to quit on me now. God's taken me thus far. He's going to keep me to the finish. He's going to take me across the finish line. That's the confidence and the faith and the trust that we have to have in God. Aren't you glad God stays the course? And you know what? I'm thankful today that Jesus Christ stayed the course, aren't you? Jesus could have said, you know what? That cross looks pretty rough. That cross looks pretty barbaric. I don't want to be whipped, and I don't want to have uh, these uh, spikes driven into my hands and feet, and I don't want to have a crown of thorns pressed into my hand. And I don't want to go to a cross where people are going to spit at me and insult me and mock me and ridicule me. It's not worth it. I'm not going to stay the course. But thank God today, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And you know what? When Jesus hung on the cross, you know what he said? He said, it is finished. I've crossed the finish line. 
I've stayed the course. I, I've remained on course. I completed what God the Father had told me to do. I did it. I, it's finished. It's complete. He could say, mission accomplished. And aren't you thankful for that today? Because of that, unlimited blessings await us. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for a passage today as we see where Joshua...